So students, I don't know if you know uh, Tom Moran and Meredith Miller, uh, but if you don't know them, you will soon know them because they, they will be teaching probably one or more of your studios here. Um, both of them are associate professors here at Michigan and also proud members of team along with Adam Fury and Ellie Abrams. And if you were paying attention to your Venice Biennale exhibitions, you would have seen their work in 2016, if I get that right. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. they're here today to uh, talk a little bit about material and their, their expertise with that very subject. Um, so without further ado, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Meredith. We'll turn it over to your way and we'll ask some questions afterwards. Awesome. Oh, thanks. Thank you. And thanks so much to the Public Design Corps team for inviting us. Um, it's always fun to kind of reflect back on our work when we have our heads down, we're focused on whatever we're doing in the moment. Um, so we enjoyed putting this together. Um, material is something that is very important to our work, both in team and the research that Tom and I have been doing for the past uh, few years. So we're going to talk a little bit about both. Um, primarily, we'll talk about an ongoing research project called Post Rock, um, and that's what this image is. Um, but I think to zoom out, the series is great. I like this idea of kind of unpacking terms that are ubiquitous in the discipline. Um, and material is a huge one. <laughs> I would say it's up there with space or, you know, it, it's something that we could, you know, do a whole lecture series on material. So we just want to add the caveat that we're coming at this and um, talking about what we're interested in. And I think the ways in which, um, you know, Tom and Ellie and Adam and I talk about material. So maybe just to kind of give some idea about how we come at it. Um, we often talk about material as just physical stuff. So what is the literal stuff that uh, we encounter uh, with the kind of physical, um, you know, the physical presence of a building? And, you know, this has very, you know, tangible properties like weight and mass and graininess and chalkiness and shininess and these kinds of things. Um, and thinking about it as stuff kind of strips away the more semantic side of material, like what is it just as a as stuff in the world? Um, and I think this can apply, you know, from the more speculative work to the more um, building oriented work that that, you know, in the end, a building is a kind of collection of, of stuff. Um, but we're also really interested in the surface and the kind of visual appearance of material and that sometimes uh, what is presented, what we kind of see, the image of a material isn't always aligned with its, with its stuff, with its kind of physical composition. And I think um, the play between those, the play between the image and what's kind of presented visually and the kind of, let's say, reality of what it's made of is um, that distance that I think a lot of, um, you know, the visual tools that we use um, allow us to kind of play with those um, with those differences and those overlaps. And this is something that, you know, we've continued to pursue from the more um, temporary installations to, to buildings. Um, and I think this last one is really important and kind of plays, um, plays out throughout the work that we'll share today, which is thinking about material as provisional. And I think this applies to both the stuff and the image in the sense that there's a lot of, um, we think of materials uh, that make up a building as coming from somewhere and heading somewhere else. So there's this kind of temporary nature to the assembly of stuff and imagery that kind of comes together in this moment that is the lifespan of a building. Um, and so in a lot of our work, we're interested in these kind of overlapping timelines, these different histories that kind of converge on, on a site. Um, and how we can sort of play off of those and, and consider the, the different trajectories, let's say, that materials are a part of, whether that's ecological or cultural. Um, and so this kind of brings us to the main um, research project that we'll share today, which is called Post Rock, which originated in this fascination that we had with a geological discovery um, a few years ago. Um, where some scientists named a new class of stone uh, and they named it plastiglomerate, which is a conglomerate of plastics that are found in waste, um, in, or sorry, in 
waste plastics that are found in like marine environments and oceans and beaches that are combining on their own without human intervention. These waste plastics are combining with sand and rock and seashells and coral and fishing line. And these rocks are turning up on the beach. And so there's this idea that, you know, the Anthropocene will kind of be this layer of this plastic rock um, composite that will sort of be the geological stratum, the geological record of the of human existence. This is what we'll leave behind. Um, but we're interested in the kind of um, material qualities of these rocks that you can kind of understand the different components that make it up. You can sort of see the traces of, of their, the different histories of, of the components. Um, and of course, part of that is tied to a very huge problem, the problem of um, a lot of plastic pollution that's kind of collecting and forming this thing that we've all heard of. All of us have heard of the gyres in the ocean, but none of us have ever seen or encountered as a kind of tangible thing. So the rocks are kind of standing in for something that we can start to um, interact with and kind of understand this larger system, this larger problem. Um, and I think we're, you know, thinking about how these components um, sometimes break down to microplastics, but some of them retain a little bit of their identity. Um, and so I think those qualities, uh, that ability to um, read or the kind of legibility of those parts is something that we wanted to kind of respond to in, in our project. Yeah, and I think it might help um, to frame material a little bit more. So I think architects often encounter materials um, that already exist, right? And are often finding the different qualities of those materials to work with. So um, you know, steel or wood or concrete or something, all these materials, we find um, ways to use their performance, like their structure or their insulating capacity or their enclosure capacity, or we look for different surface effects that you can achieve with these already existing materials. And what plastic glomerate seemed to offer was a kind of new material, rather than finding new <clears throat> purposes for an existing material, um, plastic conglomerate is kind of new on the scene. And so as architects, like, what do we do with a brand new material? This doesn't happen all that often in the, in the history of architecture. So post-rock was our um, attempt to take what was already happening, um, the, the formation of plastic conglomerate, and make it for ourselves and try to find architectural applications and opportunities for it. Um, so the big picture is we began making this um, in the studio, in the workshop, um, in the fab lab to just like test out what we could do with it and, and come up with um, techniques to make it and exploit some of these yet unknown um, capacities of it, both performance and aesthetic. So there are two types of plastic glomerate that have been showing up, again, really without human intervention. One is the in situ, which is, you know, plastics um, and other inorganics that end up on the shore and getting combined by heat or pressure on the beach. And the other is the plastic, which is being, you know, kind of tumbled about in the ocean in these gyres. Um, and again, through the friction of the water, the UV radiation um, form, forming into these Boulders. And so we, we set out to make our own version of each kind. So some are made by just, you know, applying heat and letting gravity do its work on, you know, different polymer plastics and um, inorganics like sand. And the other technique is where we would just um, apply motion over an, an a low amount of heat over long times and just let the kind of Class, but you know, make make the plastic version of it too. Um, and so these are some of our initial results. <laughs> and uh, what we got on the one hand uh, were tiny pebbles, you know, that that were basically composites of plastics and sand um, that didn't exactly lend themselves to, uh, you know, architectural application. Um, but on the other hand, we were starting to get um, these casts. Um, of larger scale and more robustness um, that offered, you know, the possibility of scaling up to architectural scale components, but also um, 
as Meredith mentioned, they left some imprint of their, you know, of their the source of the materials in the surface. So there was some trace of where it came from and what it was made of. Whereas on the left, um, you know, the pebbles just kind of homogenized everything and made them into, you know, decorative aquarium rocks or something. Um, <clears throat> and so we were really interested in that phenomenon of the material both performing and capturing all of this waste out of the waste stream, but also representing what we started calling uh, its material ecology. So if um, the if plastagglomerate that's being formed in the Pacific gyre um, combines, you know, the imagery and materiality of the fishing industry, um, you know, American West Coast uh, lotion bottles and Japanese yogurt containers and all these things that sort of show up in are showing up in um, in the plastic agglomerate in the ocean. What would be the plastic agglomerate of different regions and um, kind of e economic flows? And so um, we looked at three different contexts and designed post rock. Let's say you know the our, our version of plastic agglomerate for each of those situations through a series of design projects. Um, so on the left uh, is the urban beach. Uh, and so this includes things, well, I guess I can go back. This includes things, you know, like erosion netting, but also sand and seashells and the detritus that gets left on the beach um, in terms of like beach toys and, um, uh, and plastic waste like bottles. Um, the next being agribusiness, which produces a huge amount of plastic waste in the term in, in the form of things like twine um, and tarps and tubing and buckets and all sorts of stuff like that. It's hard to recycle. And then also kinds of inorganics like perlite and concrete and asphalt, gravel. And then the suburban domestic, um, which, you know, if, if you look around your home right now, there's probably a surprising amount of polymer plastics around you that um, you might not notice at first, but there are no shortage of plastics that show up in people's homes now um, in the form of you know, storage bins and trash cans and even the, you know, the corner bead behind your drywall, um, you know, the gaskets in your windows, that sort of stuff. And so for each of those material ecologies, we designed a piece of architecture um, situated in those locales. Um, the urban beach uh, became a project called Plastic Sunrise. Agribusiness became a project called Erratics and the Suburban Domestic Summer House. And what Plastic Beach was, it was a um, kiosk on the beach. Um, this was for a competition um, for the first Chicago architecture biennial. Um, but for each project, we made a prototype um, uh, with the given um, source material to kind of determine what the post rock for that project would be. And then we tested out a kind of different speculative fabrication method for each. Um, and so this one would be made out of like large scale um, components that would be made it together, um, kind of like tilt up concrete. Um, this one was for a folly at a, uh, and rural garden, <laughs> I guess. Um, and for this one, we proposed a bunch of kind of weedle wobbles um, that were kind of shaped like, kind of appear like cows maybe <laughs> to reference, uh, to reference the, uh, the, the region it came from, but, but also the fact that they all rock, um, if you push them was meant to invite people to kind of encounter and touch the material and and so that it would have a different effect at a distance than it would up close and getting to actually touch it and see what it was made of um, at a closer scale. And then the summer house was a, a temporary performance pavilion. Um, again, with the same idea that at different scales at different distances from it, it would present different levels of detail. So more abstract, kind of like a Roman ruin at a distance, but up close would reward you with more recognizable um, pieces and parts and figures. Um, and we were asked to um, build a prototype of this for an exhibition. And so, you know, we, we built a 
I think it was a half scale prototype, third scale, I don't remember, mm. but we built, we built a much larger prototype for this project. Um, and, mm. you know, you can see the source material on the left, you know, through the application of heat and time turned into the prototype on the right where you can see, um, you know, some of the surface effects that uh, occurred when all, all of these things were melted together. Yeah, well, I was just going to add that um, I think one of the important things about doing these competitions, <laughs> like we sought out these opportunities to design these kind of um, pavilion like structures as a way to give some criteria for us to develop a kind of tectonic idea, um, because where we started was making rocks, right? We were kind of simulating the geological processes behind plastic conglomerate. But for post rock to be an architectural material, it's like, what are the kind of, what's the tectonic language? What's, how does this kind of scale up and enclose space and hold itself up and all of these things? And so through these three um, proposals and the kind of prototyping, it sort of led us to this more monolithic hollow but monolithic large parts coming together to make space and structure. Um, and so that, that's kind of where we landed in this phase of the, of the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it might be helpful to note too that we, we kind of saw post rock as filling the same role in a way as concrete mm -hmm. in architectural proposals. So it would be something that would be both structural and visual, the same way that concrete kind of occupies that space um, for designers and architects. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that, is, that understanding has kind of changed over time as we've developed the work. So um, the next uh, project I want to show is actually a team project we want to show. Um, and so after the post rock project had started, you know, team got invited to the Venice Biennale. Uh, I'll try to give the really short introduction to this, but 12 different teams of architects were invited to speculate on the future of Detroit's architecture and were assigned different kind of iconic sites around the city. Team was asked to speculate on the future of the Packard plant, which if you're not familiar with it, um, is a really iconic building in Detroit. It's the subject of much, um, you know, social media <laughs> photography, um, you know, theorization of the, the downfall and, um, and coming back of Detroit. Um, it, and, it, you know, the, 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 let's say, poster child for quote unquote ruin porn. I hate that phrase, but, it, you know, it's, it's, I have to say it because that's what, that's what this, this kind of building stands for. Um, and so I think when we first encountered the building, you know, this was the condition when we went out there. Um, but I think what struck us about the Packard plant is that it wasn't a building anymore in any real conventional sense of the word. Um, it was a pile of materials, really. You know, it, it doesn't function as a building. It doesn't have enclosure. Nothing can really happen in there. Um, so it's just a big pile of materials. But it's also an image that circulates in the media through this kind of exposure that it gets from, you know, ruin porn tourists pouring into um, Detroit from all over the world. If any of you ever visited this place, and in fact, it's pretty closed off now, but there was a time, you know, five, 10 years ago and before that, you could just go out there and wander around and take photographs and inevitably you wouldn't be the only people there. There would be tourists from Germany or Brazil or fill in the blank with really beautiful cameras taking photographs of this place. So it was important to us that this, this like building wasn't a building at all, but it was a set of materials and a set of material or in a series of images that were just circulating endlessly on the internet. Um, but you know, it wasn't always that way. It was a building, it was a massive building. And I think it the time of its building, it, its construction, it was actually the largest building in the world. Um, and it was also a kind of um, experiment in cutting edge construction technology. Uh, the architect, Albert Kahn, and his brother Julius, who was an engineer, um, really pushed the limits of, the, of reinforced concrete. Um, 
And so they kind of invented new techniques, they patented these techniques, and the massive scale of the Packer plant expanding over time gave them really a living laboratory to test out ever new, uh, you know, uh, innovative and efficient uses of the material to um, to achieve the same kind of architectural ends and scales of space. Um, so when you go out there, you know, it's this massive building, but it was actually built over decades um, with each new building um, testing out some new technique for making um, reinforced concrete. Um, the one upshot of that is when it comes to demolishing the building, the newest parts of it are the easiest to demolish because they're the most efficient use of concrete and steel, whereas the oldest buildings are the most difficult because they're much more robustly structured because they didn't know how to make use of the material so efficiently. Um, so, you know, if the Packard plant was the, the kind of birthplace of contemporary concrete, reinforced concrete construction, um, but we don't really think of it that way. Um, we, what, when we think of concrete, we think of its ubiquity now in the construction industry. Um, an, an off-sited uh, uh, piece of data is that after water, concrete is the most consumed material by humankind. Um, and so it shows up everywhere from, you know, these uh, really socially minded houses, you, many of you have probably seen by the architect Alejandro Aravena, you know, to, to produce the cheapest possible space for people to live in, um, you know, at a small scale, all the way up to the kind of massive new cities that China has been building, like, you know, all at once. And so concrete has become ubiquitous, ubiquitous um, at all scales and basically all geographic locales. Um, so back to the Packard plant, um, we, when we you know, started to look around the site, we found you know, all sorts of building materials that existed, but also lots of trash, <laughs> um, specifically uh, you know, tires and lots of plastic garbage, as you might expect. Um, so we began to think about it not exactly as post-rock, but as a series of composites we could make um, by seeing the the sort of condition that the building was in as a, as a pile of materials, not as a um, problem, but actually as an asset. So the, the kind of like the, the quantity of material, you know, we, we tried to take advantage of um, to make new types of materials and effects uh, by, by kind of sequestering all that volume and kind of new tectonics. Um, and I, I won't go into great detail, but the way we approached the project was we made these scale models that were testing these fabrication techniques that, that we believed and do believe that could actually scale up. So they're kind of scale models, not just visually, but also in terms of you know, the fabrication technique at a small scale it could become a construction technique at a large scale. Um, and so we built this massive model for it um, that that did that work. It, it was both a kind of testing ground for construction techniques, but it was also um, a piece of scenography. So it was designed to both test the material techniques and produce images. So trying to like coming full circle. So the way we kind of see the Packer plant existing now, um, mm -hmm. our project was trying to do both of those things. Um, and so these are the images that it produced, you know, the since the model was designed to be photographed and viewed across it, um, we were able to produce a series of kind of scenographic images um, that show the different spaces, but also, you know, materials overlapping. Um, and just to return to this, <coughs> excuse me, um, but the state of, of the materials now um, being mostly uh, yeah, in, in a kind of state of decay, um, whereas the, you know, the original building was something super innovative and cutting edge. Um, okay, and so moving on from that project, we were asked to um, kind of take some of the ideas of that project and do a full scale installation um, that captured some of the ideas and material processes um, at the CCA in San Francisco. And so a team we did this project called Clastic Order, which was a column that was monolithically cast out of post rock, basically. 
Um, and so for this project, the material ecology we were interested in was um, the you know, building construction waste and demolition waste. So instead of kind of playing with some other material ecology that was out there, like they kind of looked at architecture and construction itself and saw where a lot of the waste was. And, you know, there are no shortage of statistics about how wasteful construction is and how you know, environmentally, what an environmental disaster demolishing most buildings is. So we were trying to think of a way how that like, like um, the Detroit reassembly plant, we could capture some of that waste and make it into a new kind of building material. Uh, and so, you know, this is a close up of some of, you know, the surface of the column. Um, and the way we made it was actually based on a um, type uh, or a type of concrete forming called, um, slit forming where you know it's kind it's the way they make elevator cores or uh, cooling towers for uh, power plants where you cast the first level and then the formwork actually slides up and it uses the structure below and it keeps sliding and sliding and sliding um, except with um, plastic you also have to add heat so it's a kind of heated slit form that slides up and produce the produce this column um, Oh, yeah, here you can see it in section. Um, so there are these kind of forms, but they're also heated and uh, they move along the surface. And as a, so we, we did actually two columns, one that was heated from the outside, which produced a smooth surface, and one that was heated from the inside, which produced a rough surface. Um, and so you can see, oops, you can see the different effects that we achieved in each. Um, and as a part of this, project. Um, what, once we finished it, uh, Dean Massey uh, encouraged us to do an invention disclosure, disclosure and apply for a patent because he felt that we had some novel technology here um, that you know, no one had really uh, done before. And so we did, and it set off a series of events at the University of Michigan, which mm -hmm. Meredith is going to talk about more when, um, when anybody files a patent or invents anything new, the university is really interested in inventors finding applications for their research. And so there's a lot of support here at U of M to take research you do academically and get it out there and find an application for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll go back to this. Sure. Yeah, so, so I think um, if we think about that uh, development, um, that we were talking about earlier where we started with rocks right and trying to trying to make our own version of the rock to understand the the architectural potential of plastoglomerate but it really became this other thing which is you know imagining a possibility for a building material that could divert uh waste plastics and waste aggregates and that's where the brick and the concrete come in and um, basically fold that back into um, construction uh, rather than it going to landfill. Um, but on the other hand, there's this realization and a kind of acknowledgement of the limitation of the one-off. And you know, this is an academic project. It's, a, it's an installation. Um, its impact in terms of really you know, diverting a lot of waste is very, very small. Um, so I think there was, on the one hand, this kind of strange process that began with the patent and the disclosure where all the support from the university is kind of like helping us see where there's an actual application for it. But I think there was also a really interesting question that was um, how, how could we turn this into a building material? Like what would it take to take this kind of quirky process and um, this kind of, you know, um, academic research project, how, what would it, what would the steps be to get this as a product that any architect could um, put on their building, any builder could, could use? And that has been the question that has basically occupied us um, since 2017, <laughs> when this installation happened. Um, so if we back way up to, uh, <laughs> Roman history and Roman construction. Um, I think in our heads, you know, we have this idea of monolithic construction as this more kind of, you know, 
uh, classical way of, of building buildings. And we think of um, the Pantheon as, you know, this kind of like massive and uh, incredible, um, you know, example of, of Roman construction. I think we were really fascinated to learn that um, the builders of the Pantheon actually included a lot of um, waste. Um, and as you go up through the section, in order to make it lighter and lighter as you reach the top of the dome, they threw in a bunch of scraps, like scrap pottery, you know, broken bricks, um, all kinds of things to, um, you know, a kind of stone that had like more, um, you know, a lower density. And so in, in the end, the kind of the, the poche of the um, Pantheon is actually kind of filled with, with construction waste. And it's made um, out of garbage. The Pantheon <laughs> is made out of garbage. Um, but this is a technique that the Romans use, like the, it's it's a kind of efficiency and it's kind of using what's what's nearby, right? Like what's available. And really, you know, on the lower right, um, you know, early Roman concrete, there is a way of facing the, you know, the exterior face that would be visible has a kind of facing material, whether that was like a finished brick versus all the, the stuff, the kind of cement and aggregate that got poured in the middle that actually like does a job binding it all together and making it more structurally um, sound. And so that was something that was interesting um, to us. Um, Can I add something? There? Yeah, yeah. I think what's important too is, you know, that uh, there is a, there are like some pieties within architecture that materials should kind of appear that, that you know, purely, you know, that concrete should look like concrete and metal like metal, et cetera. You know, the, the Romans are more or less credited with inventing concrete. Um, you know, it's kind of the proto concrete. But in its early days, they, they didn't just express it, they didn't expose it, they, they hid it behind rubble and things that looked more, like more conventional masonry walls. Um, mm -hmm. So, this is a way to be more efficient with that more expensive type of construction stone, masonry, and brick. Um, by backfilling it with garbage and concrete. Um, so it, anyway, there's this transition, and I think mm -hmm. there often is with almost any new material from expressing it as it is and kind of hiding it behind older conventions of building and different expectations of building, which will kind of play out when we start talking about rain screens in a bit. Yeah, and, and so I think that piety is, it's very much, you know, there's this kind of modernist, um, idea of expressing, you know, the honesty of a material. And, um, and I think one of the things that we started to realize when we were trying to figure out, well, how would post rock become um, actually used and actually have like an impact um, that really the way we build buildings today is not with material, but with products. Um, so we really like <laughs> this image on the right is confounding. It's kind of hard to understand what's going on, but it's a product display at Menards, which is our favorite local, um, you know, superstore. Um, but you can kind of see it's demonstrating the different layers of a wall section at this kind of like window opening. And they use like printed imagery to kind of indicate where the masonry would fit in. It's, but that in itself, I think we are interested in that literally, like the kind of, again, the, the disjunction between the kind of appearance of the thing and the, um, the reality of it. But these are all very industrialized products um, that have um, kind of come together in this in this composite assembly and that this is something we realized that post rock would need to be able to play well with other products. It would basically need to be able to fit within the conventions of building. And I think this is something that team has been more and more interested in as well. So, you know, after um, the Detroit reassembly plant, we're also doing projects where we're thinking about construction and how to build uh, in an expedient way and an affordable way um, and how to kind of look at the conventions of, um, you know, frame construction or in this case like SIPs construction um, and how to basically, um, you know, play with and play off of the qualities inherent to those um, materials, but also play with surfaces and moments of kind of uh, misregistering what that material is through image or paint. Um, and then of course, the productization of materials and building materials um, also plays into this, this idea of like where that material ends up, that it's kind of within a building temporarily and then it has to go somewhere. 
Um, and so things like windows and doors become really hard to reuse um, because they become these kind of composite um, objects. <clears throat> um, so the, the kind of trajectory that started with the patent um, led us into a program that is kind of like an entrepreneurship training course. And the idea is that by going out and talking to people in the industry that you want your research to impact, um, you can learn where there is a need or uh, opportunity. Um, and so looking at um, where construction is headed right now, we became really interested in rain screen construction. And it seems like over the past 10 years, because of the way the energy codes are changing and there's a demand for higher performing building envelopes. So basically more insulation, more continuous insulation um, and less air leakage that that has led to a kind of lamination of the, of the building enclosure where there's all these layers that are doing the job of keeping the weather out, keeping water out, keeping air out, keeping the heat in. Um, and then there's um, the outer layer that is doing the job of just looking good. Um, and so, you know, again, like contrasting that with this idea of monolithic concrete construction, where the concrete is the structure, it is the enclosure, it is the image. Now we're at a moment where, um, you know, what a building looks like and how it's made are not always the one and the same. That there's this kind of almost never, almost never. <laughs> there's this kind of like endless array of possibilities in terms of what that outer veneer can be and that that becomes the place where design um, can happen, right? And that um, there are a gazillion products that are basically um, vying for, uh, you, you know, the architect's uh, selection to be that outer layer. And there's all these systems and proprietary systems of clips and girders and all of this stuff. So this rain screen, um, this rain screen system um, is something that we became interested in because we've heard that um, there's just more and more of a market for it. And um, a lot of architects, again, still wanting to be honest, still wanting some kind of uh, authenticity to the material um, are interested in um, still using things like concrete and, and brick, even if it's not behaving um, structurally. Um, so this summer um, I've been doing interviews as part of this National Science Foundation program. Uh, we have to do 100 interviews in seven weeks. I think we're at 85 today. <laughs> and it's been incredibly fascinating. And I don't think I'm at the point where I've like synthesized and digested all of the information. But the idea is to basically talk to people in the ecosystem um, who are the decision makers behind how materials end up on a building. This is what our hypothesis is. Um, is that there's um, a kind of competing array of factors from um, sustainability to budget to um, a more hard to quantify uh, factor of design and a need for distinction. <laughs> um, and so we're trying to understand like what are these uh, driving factors that make decisions so that we can kind of bring that back to our research and sort of understand like what was what would post rock need to become in order to be, um, you know, to participate within this ecosystem to, to get selected to end up on a building. Um, and I think we're we're starting to kind of drill down is that if we imagine post rock becoming a kind of cladding material that can play nice with, um, you know, a kind of rain screen assembly and basically like clip on to the outside of the building, um, that it's somewhere between plastic and concrete in the, in the sense that it has plastic, um, it's, it's made from plastic, but also the kind of like mineral aggregates that we, that we include. Um, so these are two case studies that we've been looking at more closely. And by case studies, we're not so much um, looking closely at the design um, of, the, of the building, but we're more trying to understand what did all of these people involved in making the decision, um, how and why did they come to the conclusion that this was the material and this was the product that met their needs? And so we're actually talking to people in um, all parts of that decision-making team. So it's not just the architect, but it's also 
the owners, the builders, the facade subcontractor, often the facade consultant. Um, and I think these are examples of projects that are doing something um, a bit innovative. There's some risk involved. Whenever you put plastic on a building, there's um, risk of, of combustion. So plastic as a material is um, generally um, combustible. And so, you know, like wood, it's why you don't really see it on multi-story buildings as much. Um, whereas concrete doesn't have that problem, but it's often very heavy and requires more cost as a backup structure. So there are all these trade-offs and uh, it's been really fascinating to try to um, ask people, well, why that and not that? What were the values? Um, and they're off, it often comes down to like a really um, interesting mix of, you know, some kind of design idea, some idea about contextuality, some idea about, um, you know, abstraction, um, and often like very mundane demands of either the site or the budget or the construction type. Um, so on the left, the SF MoMA extension, these are fiber reinforced panels. Um, they actually got uh, Bill Chrysler who fabricated the panels, um, got fire testing specifically for this project because um, people said you couldn't put it on a building this tall. Um, but they use FRP instead of any other material because of FRP the is. FRP is fiber reinforced. <laughs> Classic, um, because the SF MoMA had already built foundations years ago, and those foundations weren't robust enough to hold the building. So every single pound mattered. And so by moving to this incredibly risky combustible material, it was so much more lightweight than any other material that they went through the expense and the headache of going through all the fire testing and using this material that had not been used in this way. So these stories are really fascinating to us because it shows that there's a possibility that there's a kind of space for, you know, something new. As Tom said in the beginning, what is the what is the architectural, you know, place for this new material of plastic glomerant? Um, and I think for us, um, how, uh, where is there a kind of appetite for risk? And, um, and kind of novelty in introducing a new material into uh, the conventions of, of practice. Um, so for now, we've kind of pivoted from the more monolithic techniques of um, casting this material to more, let's say modular or panelized um, from all that we've learned from this weird world of entrepreneurship training and talking to people in the industry uh, we think that there's the possibility that this could um, become a kind of cladding, like a rain screen cladding. And so these are our, <clears throat> the trials and tribulations of um, prototyping that we've kind of been engaged in. And we're um, building a mock-up um, that's a model of, of the mock-up that we have planned um, and making panels that kind of take advantage of, you know, being able to have some depth while still having a really thin um, a thin shell, but introducing aggregates. Um, and so, you know, where we are now is the kind of the hypothesis that um, post rock as a kind of rain screen cladding would be a way in. I think we still have, we still harbor, um, you know, a, a desire to build a pantheon out of garbage, <laughs> plastic garbage. Um, but this is kind of where where the research has really taken us. Um, and um, yeah, that's where we are. I mean, maybe as one <coughs> closing thought is, I think that the trajectory of this project is um, indicative of perhaps a, a turn in the field in general, or at least in academic research of defabrication. So, you know, fabrication 15 years ago was a kind of like, laboratory of experimentation unto itself. And in the last five years, I would argue, like may, maybe a little longer, people engaged in fabrication have really pivoted and tried to think about construction. And so it, it might seem mm -hmm. like a semantic difference, but I think it's important. So mm -hmm. there's been a pivot from the pavilion at the, you know, the like the, the Biennale and the, you know, just the kind of, 
virtuosity of using digital tools to make something really cool to saying, okay, we can do all this stuff now, but how can we take all these insights and discoveries and technologies and like get them into buildings, like build buildings with them. And so if you go down to the fab lab now, it's a much different game than it was 10 years ago. Um, it's much more focused on how do we apply all that we know as a field to you know, novel construction approaches and, and getting them onto buildings. And so, yeah, what started as a kind of fabrication experiment, I think has followed that same turn that a lot of, a lot of researchers have into thinking about how it gets on a building. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Thank you. Of course, we'll take a few questions <laughs> <laughs> if anyone has any. Well, thank you, uh, Tom and Meredith. This, uh, I've never seen the complete, incomplete story. So this is totally fascinating to sort of, to see this sort of hunch moment or the sort of uh, artful play then become wrestled into this sort of, um, you know, patented execution. Uh, and I, I'm reminded of the workings of Kieran Timberlake, um, I'm gonna say 10 years ago, uh, they, they had a studio here and every Friday they would send a box of wood things or glass things or random things. And they would never tell the students what they were. They were just these things coming from, I think it was DuPont. And so the goal of the students was to figure out what to do or is it useful? Is this anything? But it was all about DuPont trying to use the architect's imagination to decide what use the material had. So they were using our exploratory bias Right and sort of, you know, we'll freeze and microwave and melt anything. Right. <laughs> the, only, the only thing they promised was that none of nothing would kill us. Um, but like phase change materials. But they were using that oh. imagination to then go back into the world of development, so they could then market a product as something that we all could then go to Menards and find. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I'm I'm really curious about the the weirdness factor, you know, in the in the aesthetic, in the idea. Uh, and, and how important that is to sort of keep it from looking like if it looks like concrete, we're going to think of it as concrete. If it looks like plastic, yeah. we're going to think of it as plastic. And then we start to trap ourselves on how we've always used those things. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. I'm curious about the, the uh, classically wrong proportions that you're deliberately using, maybe to keep us from falling into those traps. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. It's, that's a really interesting question, and I've been really surprised um, talking to you know people in different parts of the industry, um, like who brings up what. And your question reminds me of this um, contractor who works for a huge construction company, and he's a pre-construction manager, um, and he he was saying like, well, material is really about perception. Um, so are you going to call this plastic? Or are you going to call this composite? Or are you going to call this something made up? Um, because once you say plastic, like people are going to sort of back off. Because um, even though we plastics are all over our buildings, like, you know, architects, especially um, don't really want to, they don't like talk about it that way. I really like uh, own, own that. Um, and so I think the there's, it's true that there's just kind of um, these persistent associations that come with certain materials. Um, and so I would say we wanna embrace the, the kind of like weirdness and unresolved categorization of what post rock is, that it's neither pure plastic, it's neither, it's not purely synthetic, it's not pure, it's not wholly natural. And I hope, I think we hope that that kind of inability to really like pin it down is something that is interesting. I think that the variability that of each one, each thing that kind of comes out, like the use of heat and motion, we're not in full control over the kind of um, outcome, like what the exact patterning and flow and chunkiness is. Mm -hmm. And that that is actually maybe brings it closer to a kind of natural product like a stone <laughs> that has you know veining and flaws and these kinds of things that brings it away like we've actually heard from various architects that these kind of new concrete panels like ultra high performing concrete or gfrc 
that those are very, those are too industrialized looking. They're not, they're not authentic enough because they are too similar, right? They're too machined, they're too regular. And they, there's a wish that they were like more rough and more irregular. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are these kind of qualities um, and somehow concrete has been kind of moved into the category of natural. <laughs> mm -hmm. When you talk to architects, even though like, as we talked about, it was this kind of new, you know, I mean, the, you know, the Romans used it, but in terms of reinforced concrete, it's, you know, it's, it's not natural. It actually is like a very energy intensive process in order to create cement, to create concrete, but it's kind of fallen in that category that it has this kind of rawness and, and naturalness. So it's interesting. I think the, the perception doesn't always really align with the reality of, of how a material is produced or, you know, where it comes from. I mean, same for wood products, right? There's a lot of mass timber products that are really these kind of industrial products with lots of blues and, you know, other kinds of infills. Um, but if they look like wood, they tend to be accepted as more natural or authentic. Uh -huh. Thanks. Other questions from the crowd? I ask one. Of course. Sure. Hi, Perry. <laughs> hi, hi, Meredith and Tom. Thank you very much. I've really, really interesting. I've, I've really been interested in your material research since you got here. Um, and I wondered, it's not, I was thinking while you were talking, and it's not an expectation at all, but I wondered if you've done a kind of an e ecological diagram. I don't know how to say it other than that, which inc might include things from uh, the ethics of the work that you're doing, its social implications, uh, its iconographical value, and so on. I just wondered, yeah, I just started to think about the, the kind of autopsy of um, the work as a, as a, I don't know, a, a, as a way to um, maybe comprehensively look at the various um, diagrammatic components that could contribute to an architect's work. Does that, if that, I don't know if that makes, that's sort of Perry language maybe, but <laughs> um, like this, I get really interested in the social implications, for example, construction logics and the degrees to which an Am Amish barn raising, for example, would conduct social protocols, which is different than Turner construction, you know, doing the same architecture. And I just, so I just, I guess I was thinking about the various roles I'll try to say it another way. Of all of the constituent parts that make up your work and your thinking to do with materials, mm -hmm. from ethics to social implications, to iconography, to sensate relationships, to the organizational properties. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if there exists something which is, I don't know, comprehensive is not, um, mm. I'm not trying to force that on you. I'm just trying mm -hmm. to look at the physiognomy, the the kind of ecological physiognomy of everything that you're doing and trying to just see those parts as a, a mm -hmm. relational diagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I think part of it came out of, well, I mean, I, I think Meredith and I would both identify as kind of committed environmentalists, um, mm -hmm. you know, in different ways. And so sure. I think the ethics of the project started there um and i think you know i think for us though it's not just about the kind of perf performance criteria in terms of um i don't know like, like it's not like the, the structural criteria of it are, are like not not what drives it nor is really the I don't know, I don't know how to put it. So, so basically it, it captures a lot of waste that would otherwise end up in landfills. And so like that is like one way that this material performs instead of like standing up, you know, or, or insulation. But another thing it does is produce an image, you know? And, and so I think like we're really interested in the overlap between the kind of ethics of waste and the image it presents 
while also slotting it into a kind of expectation of what a building should or could look yeah. like. Um, and so I think like where we've gotten is this kind of perverse place where um, it's, it, it's maybe appealing, you know, it, <laughs> to people to have something that's made out of t toxic waste, you know, on their building, but ultimately it's the same stuff that lots of things are made out of. You know, it's, it's almost just like wearing it on its sleeve. It's not like alternatives are not toxic or not terrible for the environment. Um, and I think the other like perverse place we've gotten is that people have pointed this out. Like we're making more of it. You know, it's like a bad thing that's happening in the ocean. And then we're over here making more of this problem to put on buildings. I mean, I think our response to that, of course, is, well, this is going to end up in a landfill anyway. You know, most of this stuff ends up in landfills. And so, you know, to Meredith's characterization of materials as, you know, kind of like temporary stops, you know, a building is basically a temporary stop along the yeah, way. On, it's on a the place way. where we could store garbage, right? Exactly. Why it's not a... <laughs> store it on our buildings rather than storing it? <laughs> For at least 100 years. So we're just like delaying this stuff from ending up in a landfill. It, you know, it will maybe a hundred years later um, mm -hmm. than it would otherwise. Um, and, and I don't know that, I think that comes from a kind of pragmatic ethics in a way, which is like, there's a certain ethical or social position where you wait around for the magic bullet, you know, to emerge, like the thing that will solve the problem. And in the meantime, anything you try to do that doesn't meet that, like, ethical perfection is seen as suspect, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we're willing to get our hands dirty and say, well, if this is the best we can do right now, like this is what we should do. And when we figure out what that better thing to do is, then we should do that. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to mischaracterize mm -hmm. like your ethics or it is, but that's kind of how <laughs> sure. I feel about it is that there's, yeah, there, there's a kind of ethical imperative to be pragmatic when it comes to issues of building. And so, um, I, I don't know, I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question directly, but like if, if I tried to pull together the kind of ethical, social, technological and aesthetic, like that, you know, that's where we get is that we're putting garbage on a building and kind of showing you that that's what we're doing. Um, but that's kind of what everybody's doing. You know, it's just that, that garbage isn't yet in the landfill, but it's headed there soon when, yeah. you know, in geological time, a building is a blip, right? So. Yeah, I like what you're saying uh, uh, very much. And I, I was maybe trying to ask something simpler. Um, I was just asking about the kind of organs that make up your interest in materials. I wasn't trying to make judgments ethically or morally. I wasn't just trying to scare things out of the woods. Basically the relational parts that belong to your thinking, again, from ethics to iconography to image and so on. Um, I know Mayor has to jump on another sorry. call right now. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, no worries, thanks uh, again. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. That's okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm just Sorry, Perry. I'm no worries. Doing Tom, my best here. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I'm. I'm not sure. I have an answer for that. No. Yeah. No worries. It just got me thinking. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Other other questions before we uh, wrap it up. Okay. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Meredith, for this. It, it was amazing. Like my mind is, is spinning like uh, maybe the first time this summer it's spinning in a new way. So I, I really appreciate the talk. Well, it's like, yeah. hmm. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I get emotion now as one of your ingredients, right? How mm. do I get, how do I, the, the walk through Vegas at midnight, you know, smoking a cigarette, how does that get baked mm. into the situation? Right? Mm. So lots of, lots of fun things. Um, yeah. Thank you all. Um, students will be posting the recording probably about two hours. Um, so uh, if your friends missed it, give them a heads up uh, and they can catch it there. But thank you again. Cool.